So I'm going to talk to you today about some work that I've been doing. I call it From Silent Spring to Silent Night, A Tale of Toads and Men. I work on a compound called atrazine. It's a so-called S-chlorotriazine. It's an herbicide or weed killer that's been used in monocot crops, mostly corn in this country, and it's been used since 1958, so it's been around longer than most of us. We use 80 million pounds annually in the United States, and it's used in more than 80 countries. So it's a global issue, but it's now outlawed in Europe, the country where the company calls home, or the continent that the company calls home. I started working on atrazine because the company asked me to look at what atrazine does in frogs. I started working in this African clawed frog, and what I showed was that atrazine causes a hormone imbalance. Whereas normally in males, you should make testosterone from your testis, what atrazine does is it turns on an enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen, which in males causes you to be demasculinized, but also subsequently feminized. Here's some examples of what happens. This is a male African clawed frog that's been dissected, that after exposure to atrazine, in addition to testis, has ovaries, large testis, and more ovaries. So it's a true hermaphrodite, which is not normal. <laughs> Even in frogs, not normal. In some cases, you don't get hermaphrodites, but you get males with testis with all that, see that stuff in the back? I call it junk in the trunk. You actually get eggs bursting out of these males' testicles. So guys, ponder that for a little while <laughs> as I talk. To give you some idea how big the problem is, this chemical, which is the number one selling pesticide in the world, we use the recommendation, recommended applications are 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. That's 290 million times what we use in my laboratory that's applied to crops, to agricultural fields. Agriculture runoff can range, as, you're shown, as shown here, from here to here. Temporary pools, levels in permanent water, and even levels in rainwater are above the dose that we use, 0.1 parts per billion, to produce these hermaphroditic frogs. As a result, all of these bodies of water are at risk for producing these types of frogs in the wild, and we've identified this problem in the wild. In fact, even in rainwater, there's enough atrazine to make hermaphroditic, chemically castrated frogs. A half million pounds of atrazine come down in the rainwater in the United States every year, and it can travel for over 600 miles. What's worse is the drinking water standard set by the United States Environmental Protection Agency is 30 times higher than we use to make these hermaphroditic frogs in the laboratory. So that means that your drinking water can have as much as 30 times higher on average than levels that we know to be biologically damaging. So what are the effects on humans, you might be wondering? A colleague of mine, Shauna Swan, showed that it, it's in your urine. So these are men in Columbia, Missouri, and red now there's significantly higher atrazine in the urine of men who have low sperm count and who have trouble getting their wives pregnant. So a similar effect that we see in our frogs at a similar level. 0.1 parts per billion in your urine is associated with low sperm count in men. That's the same dose that it takes to chemically castrate and feminize our frogs. What's more is if you look at studies done in California, here are men that work in the fields with atrazine, and here are levels in the men that apply atrazine to the fields in California. These men urinate levels of atrazine at 24,000 times the levels that we use in the laboratory. In other words, one of these guys could pee in a bucket, and we could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Nobody knows nothing about the reproductive health or health of these men because they're primarily Mexican, Mexican-American, and in addition to chemicals like atrazine, they're exposed to things like chlorpicrin which was really originally developed as a nerve gas, and in many cases, they have life expectancies of 50. What's more is the sort of environmental justice, environmental racism issue does not only affect the end user, but also affects the producers. This is from the company that makes atrazine. They have a pipe that leads right into the Mississippi River. As much as 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow in the Gulf of Mexico every year, and much of the community, much of the river looks like this in a community that's 80% African American. I mentioned that it's 80% African-American because if you look at the top 13 cancers that we're likely to experience here in the United States, African-Americans are more likely to get 11 out of the 13. If you look at the mortality rates for all of the 13 cancers, African-Americans are more likely to die, and I can show you similar data for uh, Mexican-Americans, Hispanic-Americans, are more likely to die from every one of these cancers. The li likelihood of getting the cancers and dying from the cancers may very well have a biological basis, 
But we can't separate that from the fact that African American and Hispanic Americans are more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas that expose us to these types of chemical hazards. In addition to prostate and mammary cancer, which rats get when they're exposed to atrazine, and we use rats as a model for us, there's also data showing that atrazine causes immune failure in rats, that it causes neural damage, that induces abortion because of the hormone imbalances, that if those rats that don't abort, the exposed pups get prostate disease when they're born, or they have impaired mammary development, which looks like this, and as a result, when these rats grow up, they can't properly provide milk for their offspring. So the animal that you're looking at at the bottom there is affected by atrazine that his grandmother was exposed to. When I think about my little girl and the fact that we've already been exposed, that our children will be exposed, and probably our grandchildren, and when I think about those rat data, this means that your grandchildren will likely be affected by atrazine and other chemicals that we're applying today. As a result of that and comments like this from the manufacturer, that they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results, and the fact that the EPA gives us statements like this, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. I've taken a stand. You can go to my website and write directly to people like Keith Ellison, who's written a bill to ban atrazine. You can, through Facebook, join Global Citizens Against Atrazine and become active that way. And there are multiple places where you can sign petitions to help ban atrazine, such as the Save the Frogs campaign. As a scientist and now someone who's been accused as an activist, I want to point out that a very smart man once said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. This man said this. And now that you know that this stuff in our water will affect your son or daughter, there's something that you can do. Guys, I check between my legs and make sure I don't have eggs, and write your congressman before atrazine gets you too.